Attention American poker players, do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for US players. That's GlobalPoker.com. Have you heard about America's Card Room? Already the most trusted US online poker site since 2001, America's Card Room deals out more than 246,000 hands of real money poker every day. And right now, Poker Stories listeners can get in on a great deal. Just head over to americascardroom.eu and sign up using the promo code CPPODCAST. New players will get a 100% deposit bonus up to $1,000, 20 days of free jackpot poker, and four entries into the $250 new depositor free roll. Don't wait. You can be playing poker online right now. Head to americascardroom.eu today and don't forget to use the promo code CPPODCAST for your bonus. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Welcome back to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 25, featuring poker legend Barry Greenstein. Barry is a three-time WSOP bracelet winner and a two-time WPT champion, but for most of his career, he's been known for his success in high-stakes cash games. Uh, Did you know that the biggest winner of the 2003 World Series of Poker wasn't Chris Moneymaker and his 2.5 million. It was actually Barry G who won 5 million playing cash that summer. Barry is now 62 years old and he's still at the tables grinding out a living. In fact, he was nice enough to take a break from a game when I met up with him for this podcast at the Gardens Casino in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. There are some great stories in this episode, not only about the highs, but also some of the lows, and Barry doesn't shy away from any of it. You'll hear about how he once turned down Bill Gates, uh, his high-stakes heads-up matches with Daniel Negreanu, and even why he appreciates Mike Maticel's voice. That's enough intro. Here it is, my conversation with Barry Greenstein. Barry, how are you? I'm doing fine. We're here at the Gardens Casino. Uh, You're playing a little cash? Yeah. uh, Most of the mixed games in L.A. are played here, so that's why I've been hanging out here a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Usually... I play here during the uh, weekdays because we have a kind of regular game uh, starts about three or four o'clock, and sometimes I play on the weekends at the Commerce because this mm-hmm. game, for some reason, is a weekday game. <laughs> uh, not that I play seven days a week, but I'm just what kind saying. of game are we talking? All those like Badusi and Badugi and Deuce mm-hmm. to Seven, a lot of triple draw games, throwing some Omaha eight or better. Sometimes the bigger game has some big bet games in it. Yeah. How do high the limits get these days? I saw like a 4-8 going a little bit at the Commerce, but how does it... Uh... Right, well, the typical big game now in L.A. is 2 and 400. Yeah, that's the regular, like, uh, uh, with a, a right. big mix of the... With the uh, yeah, with the... Balls. With the cap uh, and the big bet games is 4,000. Okay. And then the intermediate game is either 6120 or 100, 200. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when we play 4080 or 8160, or sorry... It's, from anywhere from 4080 to 6120. <clears throat> we also play with overs where some of the people play double the limit if they're the ones left in the pot. Oh, okay. And then sometimes there's cross booking and other things <laughs> to throw in some action, some a little more action. What about the cast of characters? How has that changed over the years? Well, the you know, you, most of the time when people ask me about it, they're thinking of the biggest game, you know, which yeah. was in Vegas. Uh, and those were all the known players and that was a bigger game obviously. This is more with people who aren't that known, not a lot of tournament players. You know, a lot of people uh, who read card player think poker means mm-hmm. tournament poker and the people you see yep. on TV. But obviously we have uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people around the country, probably hundreds of thousands, who play poker. Actually, yeah, obviously, I'm sure millions even mm-hmm. if you think about yeah. it. Um, and most of them don't play on TV and don't even play tournaments. They just either play in a home game or they play at a casino like this. Yeah, I think the uh, or, disconnect for people is that they feel like, okay, yeah, there's other poker players, but if I'm not seeing them on TV, then they must not be winning. And I'm like a winner in like a 50 or a 6120 game who plays consistently every day. You never hear his name. 
that guy's putting away some coin. And, and not only that, often those players are the better players. Yeah. Because they're the ones who can grind it out and make a living year to year. The tournament players often are people who are playing kind of a poker lottery. Mm-hmm. They're trying to have that shot to get a big score. Well, do you like the lotteries these days? Uh, the poker lotteries, well, you know, <laughs> for me, I just play the World Series of Poker yeah. because you get so many people in the big prize pools. You were going crazy like a madman this summer. It, it, well, it, that's like, for this year was the tournament of, or the World Series of almost. <laughs> I had a lot of deep runs. I had, uh, I think, 13 caches, four deep runs where, you know, I, I was, yeah. I think I was chip leader with uh, 20 or fewer to go four times. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a real shot, but uh, I didn't convert. You know, you still, the way it works out, you have to win the hands at the end. Yeah. And so on the one hand, you might say, boy, that's pretty unlucky. But the truth is to get to that point and to cash that many times, I had to get lucky a number of times. Uh, you know, and, and the... Uh, uh, but you you're know, obviously putting yourself in position. You, yeah, usually you think if, you know, you, uh, the way, what I was to say about... Uh, seeing if someone's a good player if they keep making deep runs they're probably good players Mm -hmm. because you know a lot of times one hand or one card changes the whole thing around but uh microcosm of the whole tournament was what happened to me in the uh in the main event where i uh first of all the reason i had so many deep runs i started with good tables almost all the time yeah and that that important the table draw it's it's hugely important and i had really good table draws um although in the main event the third day i got really unlucky i had three really good players with a lot of chips. I remember Antoine Saw, who made the final table, was to my left, uh, two, was three to my left. Scott Seaver was directly to my left. <laughs> and uh, Brian Tate, who uh, he's a big cash game player. Yeah. A lot of people don't know him. So all three of them had like four to 600,000 to my left, and I had 100,000 that I was nursing, 100 to 200,000. And it was a bad, just a bad situation. This is only for me. day three. That was day three. Yeah, day but three. I you're sur- supposed to not know anybody at your table still. Right, but I survived it to make the money, and then on day four I got in flips. Uh, you know, I think both of them I was a dog, but I I rivered. One was a flip, one I was dominated, but both times I rivered. I hit on the river to survive. Yeah, and I had a really juicy fourth day table. Uh, there were two good players. David Pham was to my left, and. Uh, uh, Ismail Bojang. Bojang, yeah. And uh, and besides them, there are a bunch of people just limping and you know were <laughs> clearly recreational players. It's just a, a table I couldn't believe compared to my other tables. Someone's on, listening right now going, "What's wrong with limping?" <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, and very passive people. Yeah, you know, so just what you want at this stage. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I doubled twice, and now I had decent chips. I was still under star, under average, but I was okay. And then Ishmael opens up, and I, you know, at this point I had 20 big blinds or something like yeah. that. I look down, I have two queens. And I ship it, and he tanks for a little while, a little bit of an overship, and he calls you as two jacks. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's good on many levels. One, just that I've got a, a nice uh, dominating situation like this. But the other is I'm about to knock out, we were almost even in chips. I'm going to cripple Ishmael, who's one of the good players at the table. So, uh, you know, the future so was 40 bigs the and you have control. The future was looking bright yeah. and it came small, 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 small jack on the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so again, of course that was a horrible beat, but the truth is I probably should have been out before that. So, so what I'm trying to say is people always focus on the last hand and say, look at how mm-hmm. unlucky I was. And of course it's easy for me to do the same too, but I was very lucky to get to that point. And that's really the story of my world series. I ran well to always get to these points to then get taken out mm-hmm. on an unfortunate hand. That's, you know, that's basically what tournaments are all about. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to the beginning. Chicago, Illinois, mm-hmm. 1954. What was life like back then? What were you getting into? Yeah, well, at zero years of age, it's hard <laughs> to remember a lot. Uh, but, uh, what about the childhood years? I had as good a childhood as anyone I can ever remember. I had no bad days. Really? Yeah, I didn't have a bad day. I remember the first bad day I ever had. I was about 17 years old. I remember thinking, I've never been sad a day in my life until now. <laughs> was it a particularly brutal day? or? Yeah, I, my first girlfriend and I had to break up because her parents didn't want her going out with anyone. I was in college, mm-hmm. so it was a sad day. And I remember thinking, I haven't really been sad before. That's yeah. how good my childhood was. <laughs> I had two wonderful parents, three great siblings, 
and just had a good life where I played sports all the time. That's mm-hmm. what I did as a kid. What I played baseball every baseball, single man. day from the time I was about six years old till I took up golf, which was about 12 or 13. And that's what we did in my neighborhood. The reason I had such a good life and, and got to be good at competition and sports was the neighborhood was a couple years older than I was. Okay. It was called Scottsdale on the south side of Chicago. And so it was all young families moved into these houses, starter houses, mm-hmm. and they all had kids. And that was the reason my parents and they also moved. So we had like 13 kids on my block, boys <laughs> on my block my same age. So we were all that good. Like a blast. We had block football teams. We had block fights against other uh, uh, blocks. But we had great sports teams. Actually, I had one other bad day. I'll tell you about that. We, we had really good sports teams. And almost everyone went to, uh, to college on a, on a sports scholarship. Wow. So what often happens, and you'll see this among poker players, although you think when you see some heavy guys, out of shape guys, they didn't. Uh, you know, like two, you know, high stakes players that obviously people know who are way overweight, Doyle Brunson and uh, David Benjamin. But they were David was a good junior tennis player. Yeah. David was a basketball player. So what often happens among the poker players, maybe not of this current generation, a lot of them were nerds playing online in their mom's basement. Yeah. But of my generation, they were good at sports first, and they were competitive, and then they transitioned into poker. Yeah. And that's certainly what happened See, to me. Doyle was basketball. TJ was football. I remember yeah, TJ was a football, football player. Yeah. So, you know, I played a lot of sports. I was pretty much... What position much, did you play in baseball? Well, I got when I first played second base, I got hit in the eye with a ground ball. There was rocks on the field. And then I moved to center field. And uh, I didn't have any errors. I was a real good center fielder. I remember the tryouts were for center field is they had a basket at home plate. And they needed a center fielder. And, uh, you know, I'd been an infielder, and I pitched, you know, a couple games too. But the, the guy lined everyone up and said, throw and one hop it towards the plate. And I threw a couple of balls and just one hopped them right in the basket. And he said, okay, we're done, you know. Yeah, we're done. And, Don't uh, worry about that cutoff, man. <laughs> yeah, so I was pretty fast, and I was known, you know, for, like, running past the left fielder to the foul line and catching the ball. You, know, you look like fielder, a guy who liked the slap the controls it. <laughs> well, what happened was I, you know, in Little League, I averaged over 600 hitting because, wow. you know, because, I mean, it's not a wow because in Little League, that's the way yeah, it that's works. That's triple you know. my average in but, Little League. But, so. but I remember <laughs> that uh, one time there was no way anyone could throw me out. I was fast. If I hit it to the left side of the infield, I would get to first base, yeah. you know, 60-foot bases until senior league, which was 90 feet. And uh, so I could hit it on the ground always if I wanted to get a hit. So one time I bunted. Uh, to get to first, and the, I remember the coach, and he was right. I thought he was wrong because I, I more thought you, you know, getting to, on base was the thing to do. And he said, "I don't want you to ever bunt again. <laughs> this is to have fun and to play baseball. This isn't just to win." <laughs> and I was a competitive kid, so I was always trying to win. Yeah. And at the time, I thought he was wrong, and I actually think he's right now. Really? Because I could get on 100% of the time bunting, but that's not what's that. Yeah, what's, not, what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. It becomes too easy then. Yeah. And so, uh, but anyway, um, uh, what was I thinking about baseball? I did have another bad day. The bad day was when we all got to where we were 13 years old, we knew we were going to have one of the best teams in the country in Little League Baseball. And there was the Little League World Series. Okay. And it was a real big deal. And I was the all star center fielder. Okay. And so this was a really big deal. And so what they did is we were supposed to meet at the field at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then a bus would take us to where we were going to play. We probably won our local thing. This was like a regional thing the to regional thing. Williamsport? Yeah, but now we'd move from, instead of being Chicago, south side of Chicago, we had to play somewhere else. Yeah. Okay? So it was a big deal. You know, I was psyched for it everyone's psyched for it because we all kind of knew this is the shot yeah you know for our neighborhood we're all that the maximum age for little league you know and we've been playing baseball our whole lives and what happened was the day that the bus is supposed to take us to practice on this you know big special field an hour whatever an hour away i didn't get up on time what you overslept I don't think I owned an alarm clock. I can't remember. It's too many years ago. But I didn't make it. And when I got up, I, 
I ran, you know, it's like a half a mile of the Little League field. I ran there, the bus was gone, I ran back home. I'm crying, you know, even though I'm 13 years old, probably, I don't know, I, I was maybe not, because I, I don't think I cried. I, I was one of these kids who didn't cry, <laughs> okay? Uh, so I probably wasn't crying, but I was very upset. Yeah. And I said, Dad, Dad, you know, the bus left, you gotta take me. I, and again, I did have a very good dad. I remember he took me, I think he even got his first ticket of his life taking me to drive to this place. And we get there just when they're about to wrap things up. Oh. And the decision by the coaches, you don't show up on time, you don't play. So now we've got to win this game. I get to, I think I got to go to the game, but I couldn't play. Oh. And everyone is sick because I was the all-star. You know, I was a center fielder is not only, it's not this size all-star center fielder, but he's the guy who really is the best outfielder in controls. Mm -hmm. And everyone knew, you know, I didn't make errors and I threw people out at bases and stuff like that. And we played and the way it is, this guy, you know, there were many teams in our league and you know, it was an all-star team from that league. And the coach put his catcher into center field, one of his players, yeah. you know, into center field to replace me. And I remember we faced this really big guy who looked like Rich, Rich, Rick Russell of the kid, of the Cubs, if you're, he's probably before your time. Big, fat, big guy, looked bigger than he was 13 years old. <laughs> Throw it fast and nobody could hit him. And of course I was thinking, well, I could hit him, you yeah. know. Uh, whether I could or not, but you know, of course I was thinking that. <laughs> well, what happened is we had a good pitcher too. Uh, my neighbor across the street, Tommy, was, was a real good pitcher. And it was scoreless most of the way, and then in the sixth inning, the center fielder dropped the ball and they scored a run. Oh. And so they beat us one to nothing on an error. <laughs> from your position. Yeah, from my position. And it was so sick for all of us. And like, you know, everyone was like, Luckily, most of the people on the team were blaming the coach instead of me. Mm -hmm. I didn't make the error, even though I was late, because they said, you know, how could you sit him down? Yeah. You know, but I learned a valuable lesson. And, and I know, uh, you know, you've dealt me with me before, and I've been on things. I'm never late. <laughs> I used to tell people in college, for meeting at noon, at 12.01, I'm walking. And I thought about that it. That is a very rare quality in poker players. By and the way. yeah, and I'm sure you know that I've <laughs> always showed up on time to anything. And anyone who's ever done an interview or I've been scheduled to do anything, I've been there on time. Yeah, I can count about ten poker players who are like that. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking—I don't know why—I was thinking about it. Someone was asking me, "How come you're always punctual?" I mean, I'm not going to say I didn't. I haven't had a business meeting where I had to call on the phone. Yeah, of course. And yeah. say something happened, there's traffic, there's an accident. Yeah, shit happens. <laughs> right. Or, but I'm saying I never just unannounced showed up late. You know, that, that hasn't happened in my life. And it all because Probably because at 13 years old, <laughs> I had this, uh, this catastrophe. That's good. All right. So you, uh, you go to the University of Illinois. You, get a P uh, you studied for a PhD in mathematics. I was late with that. Yeah, you what pretty happened much was, did well, it, right? Well, I wrote my thesis, and then funny things, lots of funny things happened. Well, one of the things that happened, I graduated quickly. I went through my undergraduate, graduated at 19, and then I went into graduate school. But then I was playing so much poker. I'm sorry, you graduated college at 19? Yeah. I know oh, you got I, in early. I didn't know you also aggressively took yeah, it down. Yeah. What happened <laughs> is I had to stay an extra semester. I tried to get into grad school in halfway through. I did it without going to summer school, without AP credit, but they had a really neat thing at University of Illinois. First of all, I took more courses than anyone had ever taken. I took 24 units in engineering. And the dean called me in and said, no one's ever taken this many. And I said, well, I'll make you a deal. If I ever get a C in a course, you can tell me I can't take this many. <laughs> but I never got a C in a course. I had you know, mostly A's and a couple B's. And I just, it, school was a game to me, and it was a game I was very good at. My father was a principal. My sisters ended up being professors. Mm -hmm. So I had a very educated family. <laughs> and uh, um, I was good at school, and it was very easy for me. But the one thing I knew when I taught Joey and my other kids, people know Joey, and he did well in school too, is the main thing is listen. Because the guy is going to give you a test on what he's saying, not necessarily what's in the book. I read the book too, but I said, you got to come to class and you got to listen. What happened when I went to college is everyone's there taking notes. I didn't take any notes because I had too many courses to take notes. And I would just pay attention. And then the, the week of finals, all the kids are coming up to me saying, I wrote this down. I have no idea what it means. And I would always know what it means. And the other advantage I had is I would ask questions about things I didn't know during class because yeah. I was listening. 
And the other kids are too busy writing notes and couldn't understand what's going on. So I was very good at the game of school. Yeah. And uh, although something I screwed up, I was about to graduate with highest honors. And then there was a really good poker game. And I had one test left. I had my chemistry test, my chemistry final. And if I got an A in chemistry, I'd graduate the highest honors. If I got a B, which I couldn't get a C based on my previous scores. If I got a B, I would get high honors. And uh, this poker game I thought was just too good, and I didn't feel like studying. It's my last course of college. Yeah. And I just didn't study for it. And I got a bad grade on the final, got a B in the course, and then I didn't know, because they didn't tell me, I had one of the highest scores going in, and the professor kept saying, we're not gonna grade on a curve. Yeah. But nobody would have gotten an A if he didn't grade on the curve, because I, you know. <laughs> And so it ended up he did grade on a curve, and if I'd have gotten like a C on the final, you could have just I'd have got an A in chemistry. A bit <laughs> and I got there. my degree. I didn't even go to graduation. I got the degree that said high honors, and I threw it in the garbage. <laughs> and what I try to tell you know a lot of kids ask me about school and what they should do, and I always tell them I still remember. For me, is annoying not to graduate with highest honors, and. I said, I have no idea if I won or lost in that poker game. And I'm sure if I won, I lost the money some other time or yeah. went through it. And a single poker game doesn't matter. Yeah. Get your And this was just one test and one grade. But it's, I always tell 20-year-old kids, get your degree. Get it out of the way. It'll make your parents happy. Yeah. They've supported you to this point. The poker will always be there. There's always a game. And so, you know, I was 19 years old then, and so that's over 40 years ago. Poker is still here. Yeah. Okay, get accomplished things. You know, one of the best things that ever happened to me was I was a professional poker player, and I want to get, a lot of people know the story, I want to get custody of my stepkids because some messed up things were going on. Uh, you know, everyone knows, most people know Joey Seaback, one of my stepkids, um, and my Lawyer said, you're never going to get it as a professional gambler. you got to get a normal job. So there was I, that much of a stigma back then. Yeah, it was a big a stigma. And I said, well, I, I'm about to get my PhD in math. I could be a professor. And he said, you've got to get a job that forces you to move out of Illinois or the area where the kids were. He said, where the judge just has to make a decision who gets custody. I said, well, my bachelor's degree is in computer science. There's only one place in, that was 1980. Five, four, probably yeah. 1984, where there were jobs in computers. That was Silicon Valley. So I said, I'll just take a job part time. Yeah, I'll just not part time, but I'll just get a job, work for a couple months, win the court case, and be done with it. You know. Yeah. So that was the plan, and it ended up being, uh, uh, you know, working out really well because what happened is, the bad news is, I got with this company that was a startup called Symantec. We actually took over the name Semantic. They had a loss. Uh, was one of the initial people with that. Ended up being a big company. And after two months, I told them I was going to leave. The reason I had to leave was not to quit Semantic, but I had to defend my thesis, which I had written. I had to finish the typing and defend it. And I said, I got to go back to Illinois probably for a month to get my PhD. It just occurred to me that you were in college working and playing poker at the same time. Well, that's why I was in graduate school for 10 years. <laughs> Okay. I was already 30 now, okay. almost 29 or 30, and I'd just been really lackadaisical. I, uh, another screw-up I had was uh, I could have gotten my PhD at about 23 years old. That was I'd passed all the quals yeah. and prelims, all that stuff, and my advisor said, write up what you have. And I said, but I haven't solved my problem. I had a great advisor, uh, his name was Ken Stolarski, for, I'll just throw that out. He's a really good guy, and I said, I haven't solved the problem. And he says, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You just write up what you've had, your partial solutions. Yeah. I'd done a lot of work. And he said, and then when you're a professor, that's what we all do. You write more papers where you have more results. That's just the way it works. And I said, uh, Ken, I don't think I'm going to become a math professor. He said, what do you mean? You're getting your PhD. I said, I make more than professors already. And I explained to him what I did for a living and why. You know, and I said, you know, I play poker and I play blackjack and you know, I'm traveling a lot, and uh, yeah. uh, I said, the reason I do math is because I really like math, but that's not how I plan on making money. 
And so I said, I don't want to get my PhD now because I'm afraid if I get it, I'll be done. I won't ever do any more math. Wow, oh, so you left it open. So I didn't write up my results, and I spent seven more years in graduate school not working very teaching courses for the first several years because yeah. you know I was also a teaching assistant until that but you know, just to stay connected to the just math stay world. connected and you know and I did you know and doing my work but really wow. slowly playing a lot of poker traveling to different you know different countries on blackjack junkets and, and going around the country playing uh, like a road gambler you know flying to Houston where they had hold 'em games which is kind of a new game for me you know in yeah. those days um, and what happened is then when I got married, which was kind of an accident, I'd never plan on getting married. But I met, I also was a bridge player, mm -hmm. and I met my wife, Joey's mom, at a bridge club. She's a real good play, bridge player, and lo and behold, she was a professional poker player. She played in home games and won her money that way. And I said, you know, it seemed like kind of a match made in heaven. Yeah. I never planned on settling down. I always, people used to always joke about it, uh, you know, about my life. I had a really good life, I had money from poker. I was a scratch golfer, you know, you know, stuff like that. I yeah. belonged to a country club when I was in graduate school. You know, so <laughs> you were I, just like the, the the swinging bachelor, huh? It, it, a little bit of Great Gatsby, you know. <laughs> okay. Is the way it was. You know, I had, you know, I, I really had a, a good life and uh, no worries. And people say, well, when are you gonna, you know, like take a wife? And I said, probably when I'm like 65, <laughs> because I just travel you're around. Almost I, there. <laughs> and I, yeah, I said, you know, that was just my idea that I just was never gonna settle down. Yeah. Um, but when you meet someone who plays bridge and poker uh, and beautiful and intelligent woman, you know, it just seemed like a pretty good match. And then at first, you know, of course, of course it puzzled me because I had never planned on getting married. I never even thought about getting married. But she had three ch kids. And uh, I finally said, it's just not fair to the kids, the instability of it all. I think we kind of have to make a decision if we're going to get married or not. And we got married. And then the custody thing came up, and then, you know, the Silicon Valley and all that. Yeah. So that's how that whole thing went. So when you're playing in these poker games, I heard that you didn't go to Vegas for the longest time. Well, what happened is I went to Vegas when I was in my 20s. I went to the Stardust. That's where the games were. Yeah. And well, I just uh, talked to Tom McAvoy about the games at the Stardust, and he said there was some uh, shadiness going on. Yeah, well, it, it was just not only what was, was there shadiness, but even the house would, like, bring in a cold deck. I didn't know until I met Doyle and Eric Drake later all the poker rooms and the reason poker would have a bad name there's cheating in all of them and the house often was involved when i say the house i don't mean the owners of yeah, the casino yeah. i mean the floor Dirty being floor on man, it yeah. bring in the decks and all sorts of things and i went to vegas i remember the stardust and the game was Raz. and something happened where uh i had three low cards another guy had three low cards the other guy had a face card and uh, three low cards up i actually had a seven low made already and I bet, and the guy in the middle could not call because what's normally going to happen is if he calls, it's going to get raised, I'm going to re-raise, we're going to knock him out. Yeah, he's going to get squeezed in the middle. He's going to get squeezed. But what happens is the other guy just folded out a turn. And I said, what are you doing? And I said, you know, don't do that to me. And then I realized what they're doing. They're just cheating. And we got in a big argument at the table. I don't argue much. Any, I, not much of an argument anyway, but one of the few times. And I said, you guys are cheating. And then they, they took me aside and said, we got to talk to you. And they said, we know you're a good player. We've already played with you enough hours to know you're a good player, but you don't understand the way it works here. Jesus. <laughs> they said, the way it works here is the good players are all, all wait for bad players to sit down. When a, when, a, when a tourist sits down, we take them off. We don't play hard at each other. And you can be with us or we can be against you. That's your choice. <laughs> yeah, that'll grow the game, guys. Yeah. So I just said, I'm never going to play in Vegas again. And then yeah. what happened was, uh, that was in the 70s sometime, and what happened is I never, I thought I was never going to come back to Vegas, but in the meantime, what happened is I got this job in in California, and uh, uh, I wanted to quit, but they said the company would go under if I quit. <laughs> so I ended up staying there for seven years, and Holden became legal in uh, California and Holden was like my best game and my wife was a poker player and I'm probably one of the few married men who would get these calls off because I would work I just decided I'm gonna work as hard as I used to play poker I work 17 hours a day seven days a week there was a uh, like a period of a couple months I realized because my kids would go to school at a certain time when I was sleeping 
I hadn't seen my children's faces. I talked to them on the phone, but I hadn't seen their faces. And I always hear, I always tell people, I don't know anyone who's ever worked as hard as I did. I mean, maybe there is someone. 17 hours a day, seven days a week. I never took lunch. I never took dinner. I had food brought to my desk. Man. Uh, I took a one 15 minute break that year. In 1985, I took a 15 minute break <laughs> at nine o'clock on July 4th, where they kept bugging me, go up on top of the roof and see the fireworks. That was the only 15 minute break I took that year. Did you smile? <laughs> no, I want to get back down and do my work. And I'll give you an example of how much I worked and why I worked so hard. I wrote the word processor for Symantec, for our business software. And other companies would have teams, like Microsoft Word, 25 people on the team. WordPerfect was the big product. You know, 20 people on the word processor team. And what would happen is there are what are called te software testers. Richard Brody, right? Didn't he do Microsoft Word? He was involved in it. Yeah. Software testers go company to company. Whenever you're ready for a testing cycle, you program for eight months, you test for a few months, and then you put it out. And they came to our company and they said, where's the word processor group? And I said, that's me. And they said, no, no, seriously, you know, where's the group? We want to meet with them. I said, seriously, it's me. That's why mine's faster and smaller. In those days, they had to fit in not that, many, uh, that much space on a disk, yeah. on a floppy disk, and in memory and all that. And to make it seamless, one person doing it could do a better job than the interfaces between many people. And I said, that's why my searches are faster than anything. And my word processor, when it was rated by what's called Computer Digest at the time, was number one in the world ahead of Microsoft Word was number six. Word Perfect was probably number two. So if you look in 1986 in the magazine, Q&A, which was Q&A right, was the right part, was was my part, the database was this other part, was Q&A was the whole product, I was the number one worded, rated word processor and beat out all these other companies. But it nearly killed you. No, it didn't at all kill me. You didn't mind the work? I played no poker burnout? like that. No burnout at all? I wasn't burned out at all. Wow. That's how I played poker, because I was strong at that time. I could play poker for three days straight. What I would do is I'd, you know, I played, I did sleep my six, seven hours every night and worked and I, because I think the thing that drove me was because I didn't go back and defend my thesis and officially get my PhD, I didn't want to be thought of someone who didn't finish things off. Okay. And I also, I wanted to see if I could work it hard to produce something as I did. You know how when you play poker and you're 20 years old, you play all night and sometimes play the whole weekend. I wanted to see if I could put that same energy into something productive and, and you know, produce something. Yeah. So that was a lot of the driving force. Testing yourself again. Just to, it was, yeah, it was important to me to know, to kind of prove to myself who I am. Yeah. Because when you go into poker, especially at a young age, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of these guys who I've been telling, when online poker is down in the United States, get your degree. When you get older, you're going to be, if, especially if you're a smart kid, and a lot of these poker players, of course, they're smart kids yes. if they're top poker players. You're going to start thinking, what did I ever do? What did I ever accomplish? All I did is try to make money. So I didn't want to get to 40 years old and be saying that about myself because I was thought to be a pretty smart kid when I was in school, and you know, in math and in graduate school. I was thought to be one of the smarter graduate students. So if in the end all I had was money to show for it, that would be a pretty hollow, hollow yeah. existence, especially the way I was raised. I was raised that being successful had nothing to do with money. It had to do with making the world a better place, accomplishing something. So it, it would have been very hollow the way I was raised. And uh, um, so I did accomplish something. I worked for seven years. What happened is some, I, we had five employees when I started, and it ended up we had 1,000 employees oh. seven years later. And it just got too big, and it got to where people, we were hiring what we, I call middle management, and they would come to me with stupid ideas, and I would explain to them why that doesn't work because they hadn't been there the last seven years in a lot of cases. And the other thing that would happen, they'd have meetings, and I, would, I never wanted meetings. They'd always try to get me to manage products, and I'd say, no, no I don't want to. I think everyone in corporate America can I don't want to be in meetings. And the worst part, again, like, of being punctual, yeah. they would have a meeting, let, let's say, 3 o'clock, and I'd show up, and other people would be drifting in. And I'd say, I'm not going to do this anymore. When everyone is there, call me, I will immediately come. I'm not going to sit for 15 minutes and chit-chat. I've got too much work to do. 
And you so, don't seem like the type who suffers fools. Yeah. So, easily. so yeah, I didn't like that at all. The company just got too big, and then I quit. And what happened is when I quit, we had three main people in, that we thought that were managing a lot of the software stuff. The first one quit, and he said, you'll never put out another product. Uh, we did. The next one quit, uh, Brett, great designer. He said, there's no way they'll put out another product. We did. But when I quit, we never put out, they never put out another <laughs> yeah. product. Symantec now is a company that uh, owns other companies that we bought with the money made from our original thing. Got it. It owns, and the, the largest company we bought is called, uh, um, what is it? It's the uh, antivirus, and Norton. Norton. No, we bought Norton. By so and that, that's where I've seen actually, the name Symantec before. Right. My so Symantec computer. bought Norton while I was still there. So Symantec became no longer programmers. It was just salespeople that sold other products. Yeah. So I once I quit, they couldn't put out another product. They tried, but they couldn't get it done. Um, but anyway, so that was, at least I accomplished something there. Yeah. And uh, it's a good thing because it was good for my kids even though I still worked hard, they probably saw me less than when I played poker. Uh, that's the beauty of being a poker player. You can spend more time with your kids and you can schedule your life, you know. Uh, so it's a, it's a good job in that way. Uh, but uh, what I did have at different periods over that, uh, different times over that seven years, my kids come to the office and see me there and uh, Apple was starting up and they play with a Macintosh and uh, you know that was the new thing. So my kids were computer literate, so it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Because uh, everyone needed, we didn't know then, but it was really good for my kids to be computer literate as they w went to their adult life. And one more thing I want to throw in, I always like to throw this in, one day Bill Gates will have this. They wouldn't let me meet Bill Gates when I was at Symantec. Because the way programmers were in those days, they were what we, I would call hackers. They weren't trained. I had a degree in computer science. Most of them were like learning by the seat of their pants. Yeah. So I was a top programmer and, you know, felt I was the best programmer in Silicon Valley at the time. Um, and Bill Gates snuck into my office and he said, they won't let me meet you. Uh, I will double whatever they're paying you. What? And I said, I don't work for money. I work for my projects, and I can't can't give up my project. And he left. And uh, was he upset? Because he not, was known for. But they. That's why they wouldn't let him meet me. Oh man. And one of these. And I've met Bill a couple times. I met him at uh, someone's party and stuff like that. I never brought it up. But one of these times, I'm sure he doesn't remember it. But uh, I'm gonna ask him if I ever see him again. Uh, you remember sneaking in my office and doing that. <laughs> He's kind, of a, he's kind of a big deal now. He, he, yeah. wasn't, he wasn't quite so big then. <laughs> um, so, the, yeah, those first few years when you're playing poker exclusively for, you know, a living, uh, you're avoiding Vegas at the time. Um, what, what were the games? Where were you playing? Just in L.A. or no, the I'm, Bay I'm Area? No, fr I'm from Chicago. No, I mean, when, but this was after Symantec. Yeah, I, yeah. First, I was in Chicago. Then I moved to Champaign, Illinois, where I went to school and played there. Like, I remember one time before we get to, to uh, L.A., I was being interviewed. I could easily get a job as a professor even before I completed my PhD because I had a bachelor of computer science. So it was really huge if you could get a mathematician who knew yeah. who also knew computers. And these people, I remember like University of Pittsburgh or something, they come and interview me and I'm dying to ask this one question and the question is, are the poker games good there? Because I knew I could make more money than a professorship <laughs> playing poker, but like you can't really ask that in an interview, especially with the stigma of poker. Yeah. You probably could now, but yeah. back in the 1970s, you couldn't ask that, or, or 1980, you couldn't ask that question. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't want to leave Champagne. The poker games were great. But anyway, yeah, I did eventually come and played, and Holden was legal. And am I repeating myself saying my wife would call me up screaming at me and say, what are you doing at the office? Do you know how good these games are? <laughs> and she was going crazy because I could make more money playing poker. Yeah. And during, between projects, there were like four or five projects that we finished, I would now play poker to support my job. I would rush to play poker for a month or so to pay off the credit card bills to pay, because my salary initially was only $43,000 where I could make six figures playing poker. We always lived in a nice house in a nice area and had kids, whatever. 
I was used to living the high life as a poker player in my 20s. Now I'm in my 30s and I can't, you know. You gotta go put the hours in. Yeah, and, and I'm not making enough money. I got I had stock, but it wasn't, you know, yeah. vetted or usable at this point. Um, so, yeah, I play, so again, uh, you know, most wives would be saying, what are you doing playing poker? Mine's screaming at me. What are you doing not playing poker? And so I didn't play much poker during, you know, periods of projects between them I did. And then finally with Hold'em Legal, I just couldn't, and the company got too big. I said, I got to play, start playing poker. So I played poker. I did pretty well. And eventually the games were bigger in LA. I came to LA and made a bunch of money. And when I was 50 years old, I said, I think I'm ready to quit. And I was actually possibly going to go back. I was actually told my advisor, I'm going to get, finish off and defend my thesis. He said, they want you to stay at Illinois for six months to see what's been done in your area. And then the poker boom hit. And then I didn't know what to do because I really felt like I should be involved in the poker boom. Yeah. And my mom had died, and I said, do I really need, why do I need the thing that says I have a PhD? I'm a mathematician. I've written things. I've published things. I'm involved in stuff. I've given lectures. Yeah, you did the work. You know your stuff. I did the work. I can call myself a mathematician even though officially uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't have my PhD, and I finally said I should probably be in poker. This is the right place for me to be. You can just tell people you have a PhD, and no one will look it up or question no, it. No, people always called me doctor and said I had a PhD. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I went back to Illinois and even lectured at University of Illinois, and I was obviously with the poker room more popular than any of their lectures. Initially, it was supposed to be at the math department, and then they said <laughs> it's just too big. They yeah. invited me because they knew I was. I think it was right after I'd written my book, and they said. We didn't know how many people would want to go to this lecture. They had to put it in the assembly hall. <laughs> I filled up the assembly hall, and people like Jimmy Fricky and Faraz Jacques are probably there. They're mm -hmm. from University of Illinois, and uh, who's the kid? Uh, Mosin, Mosin Terrania. Terrania, yeah. Those are all Illinois guys. Uh, there are some others. Uh, and we filled it up, and, and they said it's amazing. They could, the math department couldn't believe it. It was sponsored by the math department. Yeah. And they said, we've never had obviously for a math lecture. We've never had anything like this. And it was the first day of basketball practice in the days when U of I had, had an open basketball practice. So that was a huge thing. There was also some big concert and I filled up the assembly hall for people who were still going to <laughs> university. That's how big poker was. You wanna know That's how big good. poker was that in those days it was big. Well, let's go back to the start of the boom because you were in Vegas during the moneymaker win and I read that you had a very good summer, even better than money. Yeah, Maker. he won 2.5 million. I won 5 million. Playing. See that you're throwing out the number 5 million just playing cash. Cash games at the World Series of Poker. Yeah, four and eight thousand cash at the World Series of Poker. That uh, one other person won almost the same. We we had two big winners, me and uh, myself and Ming Lee. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know Ming Lee, but he had. We just had a great summer. Didn't he finish? I feel like he finished tenth in the main event. He may have one year, yeah. but we were just killing it. And it, I was. And what happens, it kind of snowballs. When you're doing well, if you manage yourself right, and people who've read my book know there's a lot of management stuff. I was always getting sleep. I was always getting there to tired people the next day who were losing, who weren't getting sleep all the time, yeah. and just crushing them. Not just playing tournaments. Them. I know, I didn't play. I played probably the deuce tournament in the main event, Yeah. And uh, which is what I used to play. I used to play like two events. And uh, and so you know I just killed it. And uh, was there a lot of like whales, or was it just tilt and tired poker pros? It was all the normal people. I mean, I don't want to say what happened to Chip Reese because he's obviously one of the greatest players of all time. But yeah. uh, he wasn't a good do, summer. For it him. wasn't a good summer <laughs> for him, and probably not for Doyle, and probably not for a lot of other guys. Yeah, of the known players who were all these great players, and a lot of it was management. I'm not even playing. I mean, I think I was playing better than anyone else at that time, and I'm sure Chip and Doyle would say at that time they certainly said I was the best player in the world, whatever that means. Uh, but uh, management is so important that getting your rest and being sharp and knowing how to. And the one thing I never did that a lot of people do, I never chopped and took a small win. I always beat people into the ground. You know, where I they were losing, I'd take advantage of the situation. And uh, you know, I did to the max, and uh, well, that's what it a good came pro out does. to. It came out to you know at least five million during that. I remember my tax bill was three million that year, 
So, uh, uh, you know, I had a couple good years of paying seven figures, which the IRS, after a while, when I stopped making money like that, says, where's our millions? You know, <laughs> what are you doing? You're not paying your taxes. I said, I don't make money like that. The anymore. IRS yeah. is rooting for you. I said, yeah, I don't make money like that anymore, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so they couldn't understand where all what happened. Oh, man. That's $5 million in playing for you. That's a lot of big bets. In, a, in, a, in like a month, you know. That's just insane. Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously Stars comes calling. That works out. Uh, are you still with Stars? Well, Stars How? didn't really come calling. What happens? They came calling lots of times. And I turned them down. I never needed the money. Mm -hmm. But you know, as you know, I gave a lot of money to charity, and then things changed in poker. And part of it was my real estate and stock stuff. I'd done a lot of stuff, bad stuff. Uh, it's stupid, really, because I made my money playing poker. But somehow, and a lot of pokers do this, you get into business, and I have a chapter about poker players are the worst businessmen, and I yeah, was the they worst. they all want a passive because income. Because what you do when you're a poker player, because the money comes and goes, so you just throw money at the problem. And so I was a horrible businessman, and not counting Poker Road, where I lost a million there too, uh, but we had a good thing, and uh, yeah. you know, I think we were undercut by the uh, uh, you know Black Friday. Yeah, it hurt. Yeah, but... Uh, um, you know, I lost a lot of money in the market and other things. And, you know, no poker stars had come to me a lot of times. I always turned all the sides and full tilt, always turned them down. But it finally got to a point where I said, you know, it might be nice to have that extra money coming in because yeah. the money they pay me, you know, my uh, my mortgage was like 17000 a month. So, oh, my gosh. So I said, you know, having poker stars paid instead of some other way. That is more than 10 times my mortgage Yeah, payment. right. Yeah, I said that would be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of a good deal. So, Man, uh, I think I saw that house. Was that on the Card Player yeah, TV video? Yeah, it's, it's probably still up there. So I said, uh, uh, that'll be nice. So finally one time I said, okay. And I made an agreement with them. I said, I will work for you only on one condition. I get to determine what games go on the site, that I'm involved with the programmers and I'm involved with that. And they gave me that deal. And uh, so I would put on deuce to seven i wanted to be no limit also and they messed that up because there was a misunderstanding but the triple draw stuff and all that you know i put that on the site you know okay. before anyone else and badoogie and we were going to eventually put badoosie but we didn't because we didn't have enough traction yet so i was involved in that kind of stuff so that so part of the deal was that i was intimately involved in that you know in, in constructing what games went on the site and uh um anyway so that happened, and at first, I didn't know that I'd need the money that much, but poker went downhill. My, my properties that I owned started to be worth, get, not my house, but other things, yeah. worth less than I owed on them. I gave away a bunch of money because I never thought I'd need money again because yeah. I had money coming in so easily. Yeah, you were, I guess because of the $5 million cash game win, were yeah. giving away all of your tournament winnings. Right, because I didn't need money at that yeah. time. I, and so now... Lots of things change, and now I really did need the Poker Stars money because yeah. what happens when you have a lot of money at one time and then you don't, you still have the same bills <laughs> yeah, and often the true. same habits and often the same people you help out, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So now I needed money, and so uh, um, and stakes just kept getting lower and lower and lower, and uh, so you know I went from pretty much retired at fifty to having to work again at sixty. Yeah or 58 whatever it was so you know things changed um but again the good thing is i never cared about money that much and that may seem strange a lot of people will say well you play poker for money you know you must care about money but it's actually the opposite the people who end up doing well poker don't care about money because yeah. if you cared about money you couldn't just bluff for something that's the size of a that would buy you a nice car yeah that easily Money never meant that much to me. You need to have a complete disregard for it. Yeah, I disregard their chips. Even now, sometimes I play small stakes, sometimes I made it in playing in a bigger game. It's still just chips to me. Yeah. I never really think about it being money, and I think more about what's the right play here, not about how much money is it. So, you know, it's that mentality. So not having money when I had money for a long period of time, uh, you know, now you know, I have to work or, and, you know, I play poker. If you see me playing poker, it's because it pays the bills and allows me to have nice things. You know, yeah. that's why I do it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's the way it is. And 
um, you know, it's not, you know, I don't play. People think I'm still, I mean, people want to know why I'm not donating money to certain causes or helping them out with their cause. Uh, I don't have that money like I used to. And if you see me playing the poker. The poker world doesn't have the money all, like Yeah, the poker world, poker all the time. It isn't because I'm doing it for fun. People come, oh, you just enjoy playing poker. You love poker. <laughs> no, it's my job. It isn't something I do for fun. It's something I do to make money. Well, are you enjoying the fact that it's a job now these days? Or like, uh, is, do you like the rush? or is there... It's a better job than other jobs yeah. because you get to play when you want. I set my own schedule for the most part. And I go out uh, with my partner, you know, to dinner, or whatever. On the weekends, we do stuff and whatever. We have our own schedule. My kids are going up, but you know, if I want to do other things, I do other things. So, I like being my own boss. I yeah. like setting my own hours. Can't beat the freedom. Uh, yeah, the freedom is an important thing to me. Uh, I, you know, every time someone says you still love poker, I always give the same answer. I never loved poker. I didn't do it out of love. I did it because it was a way I could make money easier. Than other jobs, you know. That's why I became a poker player. I love it. Let's uh, talk about the Dana and Ground your heads up challenge because that's what got me into poker was like seeing that take place all the time, yeah. reading along the updates. Who's you gonna know, win? I, what I, is the game gonna be? I guess I made a mistake uh, in that. And and here's what happened. Originally, you know, I was a high stakes player at that point. Daniel wasn't, but he was a tournament player and was making money. And he had he had a sponsor. He had his Full contact poker. I don't think he was even with Poker Stars yet. No. And Dan, it was, was it Poker Mountain back then. I remember he had his own site for a little bit. Full contact was the one thing, but he yeah. also had a sponsorship with the Win. And uh, you know, he was Daniel. You know, at this point, I would think you have to say he's the biggest name in poker. Uh, but he was building to that still at that point, where people wanted him to represent things. And. Cash game wise, he certainly wasn't at the same level that I was. Uh, but uh, he said, "Well, I'll play anyone, any game at the win," because he was representing that card room. And I told him, "I'll play anyone too. I'll play you." You know. And so what we did is, is I, is I wanted to first play him low ball games. And then he said, "He low ball wasn't a strong point for him." Yeah, he, he gave said, you like nine games. He said, choose. no, no, you can't play those games, but I'll tell you what games I will play. And I said, I'll play them all. We'll play them all one at a time, okay? <laughs> and I said, the only one thing, since you got to choose which games I can play, let me choose the order. Okay. Okay. So what I did was I had been playing a lot of stud in the big stud game. And I originally was a bad stud player, but I learned to play from you know by playing against good players got to be where I was good and, and uh, I was much you know Daniel hadn't played against the top players and stud so I had a big edge on him frankly and it was so big I beat him pretty easily for five we played 500,000 freeze out oh first what I said before I even played him I had Mimi who was my girlfriend at the time play him hold him Mimi Tran yeah yeah and I don't know what Daniel's recollection of it but Mimi felt they went up and back and Mimi <laughs> Thought she was going to close him out. They had a real big hand where whatever someone he drew out on her, and then he he uh, he came back and he beat her. So he beat her first. She had a lot of money from poker too. So I said, okay, he beat he beat Mimi. I'll play him. So I play stud and I beat him pretty easily. He wasn't good enough really to know how easy it was for me. Okay. Because there are hands that I was playing different ways just so he would know he was drawing dead. I would sometimes act like wouldn't raise him to the river, and you know he thought he got outdrawn, but he didn't. But you know I was a top stud player in the world, one of the best stud players in the world at that point, yeah. and he wasn't. And we had a rule that you could ask for a rematch. And he made a big mistake. He asked for a rematch in stud, and then I made a terrible mistake. I was beating him easily again, and I made a big mistake of letting Alan Boston sit behind, who's a decent stud player. Yeah. Uh, uh, Daniel said, can Alan sit behind me? And I didn't think about it, and I was having such a good time. I said, sure, I don't care if Alan sits behind me. But what I didn't know, Alan's one of these guys who's very honest. He says exactly what he's thinking. And Daniel, after a few hands of playing, and you know me again, he says, can you believe this? He's just killing me. He's just I'm so lucky. And Alan looks at him and says, Daniel, you're drawing dead. You don't even know how to play the game. <laughs> 
And it was really dumb of me because I actually think Daniel would have rechallenged me to stud and to yeah. add it, maybe add it to playing stud forever. Yeah. And so now <laughs> we. Uh, was he going to stud high low or something? So, yeah. So now we went to stud high low, and I'm sure Daniel will say he thought he was the favorite. I thought I was the favorite. But long and the short of it is he beat me. Yeah. Okay. And so now I said, what game should I play? And I knew a game that wasn't good for Daniel because I knew he hadn't played a lot was PLO. But it was a very volatile game. And he had a guy writing up the hand histories. And we had like six all-in pots. And we each won three. But the three of, three of them that he won, I remember one, he had like a gut shot and a flush draw, but he didn't have the nut flush draw. I had the higher flush draw. Just almost dead, and he yeah. won that. And it was unfortunate. The problem with playing big bet, a big bet game, I should have chosen a different game. I can't remember. The one game I knew was his best game was Omaha High Low. So that was going to be the last one. And he was the favorite over me at Omaha High Low at that point. But the other games, I could have chosen some other games. I can't remember. Not a big bet game. But big, but the bet, big games bet games are very volatile. High variance. Right. But yeah. what happened was, whatever, he ended up winning. And now we're back to even. And we were also cross-booking the tournaments. But for me, I was used to playing this much poker, and he wasn't. I was beating him in the cross-book in the tournaments. And finally, he just came up to me and said, I'm, my sponsorship with Win." or first he said, I don't want to do both anymore. Yeah. And then he said, I said, okay, we'll finish out the nine games, okay? And then he said, my sponsorship's over. Oh, okay. And so he said, we're even. And I said, yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, in some sense he was up because I had a piece of Mimi in the in the thing that he won. Yeah. I didn't have all of it. She had some, I had some. Someone else had some, I can't remember who. Uh, but on mine against Daniel, we ended up even. And uh, then we just didn't play again. And that was the end of that. Uh, let's talk about um, this quote I read from the LVRJ this summer. I probably don't think the game has evolved as much as some other people do. There's just more players, so there's more good players. But I think poker's poker. Do you still believe that? Oh, for sure. You know, uh, the the that mark seems of a like good a crazy poker. Thought to me. No, the mark of a good poker player. It, it's not that there isn't an evolution. But if you're a good poker player, good at anything, you're going to adapt the environment. I remember when people first started three betting, and they, if you watch my first uh, uh, WBT that I won, I three bet someone with nine three offsuit or something like that. And the thing is, all these plays they didn't have names for it when I was twenty some years old. I made all those same plays, whether you want to call them merge plays or this plays, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I did everything these kids thought they invented <laughs> thirty years before they invented them. Okay. <laughs> And it's just funny that they'd say, oh, no, like or Harrington's book. Or, and I'd say, there's nothing there I didn't do at 20 years old. Yeah. There was certainly nothing new in that book that I didn't do when I was in my 20s, you know. And so, uh, they, you know, these were things that, as Doyle will tell you, and unfortunately Sailor Roberts can't tell you because he's not here, we did, we, we, we played really well. Now, the one thing that changed was people had head-up displays and could play online poker where they could get really dead read on how often you bluffed and what your ranges were and stuff like that. That was different. And what that meant was these young kids would, of course, have an edge on someone who didn't have that uh, and could beat good players. And then what happened when they play live? They were donkeys. You know? yeah. And the truth is when these online kids came into a live game, and it's still the case today. I mean, I'm not as good a player, obviously, at 62 as I was at 50. But there was a long period of time where someone who was a world beater on the internet and could beat me too came to my, to a live game and they would be dead meat. Yeah, they weren't used to not having that information to help them. Yeah, they could not play. There was a, because there are tells and there are other things. And not only that, like I remember playing with Patrick, who obviously is you know one of the best players in the Antonio. world. Yeah, online you know, became you know, one of the top two or three players in the world, obviously. Now, what happens with an online player, they know what to focus on and what's going on online. And part of the reason Patrick couldn't be as good, I mean, obviously, eventually he became a great live player, too, 
was for an online player going to live, he doesn't know what to think about while the hand's going on or how to think. You see them, they become really slow players because they're kind of confused. You know, whether it's Tom Dwan or whatever, you see them like thinking, thinking, thinking. Yeah, because they've got to count play, stocks. And, I, yeah. You play eight games at once. How can you come to live <laughs> and like you sit and tank and don't know what's going on? But part of it is they, and when you play, it's a different type of thinking. Live poker, you're paying attention to what everyone's doing. You look at your hand before they look, you know, right away, which online players don't. And you know before, when I was a top player live, not only would I know what I was going to do before it came to me, which people will be surprised because an online player doesn't react till the screen pops up and says it's his turn. Exactly. So he, then he processes the information and acts. And so you might say, oh, that's a difference, right? I know what I'm going to do before it gets to me. So I'm prepared with my, you know, it, with my, if you ever watch me yeah. play, my tempo was a second, well, no matter what I'm doing. If I take five seconds, I'm, I'm actually, I'm faking it. <laughs> because I always knew what was going to happen before it got to me. I'm trying to get the guy to think I have a problem. I don't have a problem. You don't watch me. I don't ha take more than a second. But you might say, well, that's pretty good. And that's the difference between me and an pl online player, which is true. But here's what's even better. Not only did I know what I was going to do was my turn, I knew before the card got turned. I'd say if it's a spade, I'm doing this. Yes. If it's a if it's a if it's a six, I'm doing that. If it's a scare card, I'm going to try to bluff at it. Whatever. I actually before the card got turned, the ahead. I already knew what I was going to do. But so it's a very different way of thinking about poker than an online player because an online poker you don't think that way for a yeah. number of reasons because you're playing too many screens, you're using that information. And they play, I always used to accuse them, and when they got to be live players, they realized I was right. They're playing blackjack. They're not playing poker. They're not thinking through these things as they come up. They're just processing a blackjack situation based on that it's information on the screen. And, it's reactive instead of proactive. Yeah, they're, they're not like reading, playing that much differently with the same cards that, as I am, you know, where you know, I'm doing many different things and bet sizes and folding the, that same hand in that situation based on what other people are doing and what's going on at the table, online players don't do that to the same degree that a live yeah. player does. So it's a very different form of poker. And what happened, if they really were good poker players, the first year they were playing, they were arguing with me that I was wrong. Then they had problems, and then a couple years later, they said, you know, you were right. They had to learn. The good poker players learn. Good poker players are going to be good poker players, whatever the environment is. They're going to learn what you have to learn. But, and, I, and sometimes when they'd argue with me that, no, I was one of the best online <laughs> players, I'm ready to play live, I said, let me tell you, you're 23 years old. Come back to me when you're 25 or 26 years old and tell me you haven't learned anything. And you yourself, even if you think you're better than me now, because there's a lot of ego involvement, yeah. you aren't going to be better than your 26-year-old self. I guarantee you that. And, of course, at 26, some of them who were like, just sure, I was an idiot, just like Mark Twain's talking about his parents, mm -hmm. came back and said, okay, I apologize, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you hope the kids do all the time. Yeah. Mom and dad were right. Um, rapid fire questions to close it out. Sure. Uh, biggest pot you ever won or lost? Actually, I'm guessing that was the high stakes poker, million dollar pot. Um, yeah, that was that the biggest or have I lost in land? Probably 900,000 with Durr was probably the biggest pot I lost. I know in the cash games that we used to play, we used to play with a hundred cap, so you know I'd win four hundred thousand dollar pots, four ways cap. Yeah. But so, if if somebody straddled or something, it would be a hundred fifty cap. Oh, okay. You get so, enough people in there. So that'd be a so I probably have won a six hundred thousand dollar cap and live four way cap and live probably a PLO pot before. Did those get you sweating at all or? Were you never that uh, emotional? I had so much money in those days, I didn't even care. Yeah. It really didn't it didn't matter at all. Some of the plays, even the play against Durr, uh, you know, where I laid down aces and I got confused on the hand, didn't think it through. I thought Eastgate had a deuce. The money meant something to me then. It was very different to play big bet poker when the money means something. Limit poker is not so hard. You know, I was earlier talking about it's just chips. Yeah. But that more applies to limit than no limit because if the money really means something, you can't lose it. 
you know, and all I had on on me was that money on that I brought, a couple hundred thousand, whatever it was. So I didn't want to go broke. So it definitely changed the dynamic. People always like like one hand people talked about to, with me is the Brad Booth, yes. La Phil Ivy off Kings. Mm -hmm. When you okay. had the big bricks of cash. That was all the money Phil had. Brad had someone else put him in the game. <laughs> Actually, the guy who put him in the game was really mad about Brad making that play. Said it's easy for him to do. It was my money. <laughs> uh, but Phil, it was a funny thing that happened. In those days, you know, Phil used to call me all the time. Now I don't hear from him so much. He's a big deal. But uh, he's a little busy. Yeah. In court. But uh, he called me up at the break, and he said some businessman made a big bet I'd Kings and I laid them down. And I said, well, what was the action? He told me the action. I said, who was the businessman? He said, his name's Brad. And I said, Brad. And I said, wait, 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 is he a kid? And I described him. He says, yeah, that's the guy. But Phil had never seen him before. I said, he's not a businessman. He says, I thought the guy slow played aces. And I said, I said, Phil, that guy bluffs a lot. You had to call him. You had, I said, I guarantee you Kings was good. Okay. Man. And Phil He'd said, "He'd only known who Brad was." He never. And then Phil said, "Well, there's another problem. I didn't have any more money." Yeah. Phil had we had more money in, in his life. life. Yeah. But he brought that amount that he made a mistake, which I told him not to. He put it all on the table at once, and so he said, "I didn't want to go broke, like right at the beginning of the show, you know." And so I didn't call. So people think Brad made some great play. It was the circumstance. He didn't know who Brad Bur Booth was, A. And B, <laughs> he thought he was a businessman. And C, he had no more money to take out of his pocket. And he thought it would be really embarrassing because, you know, to go broke on TV and not have any more money. Yeah, I have to ask somebody. So, for so that's actually what, for people to know, no, Brad didn't make this incredible play. Phil had three things going against him. <laughs> and then at the next phone call, I'll never forget the second phone call, I, Phil says, and remember, he hadn't seen Brad's car yet. He said, okay, you were right. I should have called him. Kings were good. <laughs> so he already knew it Yeah. by the second break. And then he said, I said, well, I said, you know, I used to get upset. And I said, Phil, you know what you did wrong? I said, you know, you could, instead of being so cocky, you could ask me about all the players at your table because I know them better than you, and I yeah. would have told you how people play. I don't feel like I, Ivy's a guy who Googles his opponents. No, beforehand. he doesn't know what Google, he didn't know what Google was. He had only been on a computer to play online poker, and so he said, "Okay." Uh, so I said, "Do you want me to tell you how they play?" And I never forget. He said, "Bear, I've been playing with them for two hours. You think I don't know how everyone plays now?" <laughs> so, oh man, that's good. Although he did at least. The first year they had the November 9 or the second year, whatever it was, he finally learned his lesson. And every day he would say, come to my table, see if you know these people, yeah. tell me how they play. <laughs> and I would know some of the online players. I remember one guy he had played with at like about the fourth day. I said, that guy Trex? He said, Trex? He's the guy Trex online? I said, yeah. Dang. His last name's Dang. I said, He's a good player, Is that you know. Hacker, Hacker D Dang. I don't even remember one which of the, one. One of the Dang brothers. Right. I said, yeah, he's a good player, mm. and he said, well, I play with him all the time. I said, okay, aren't you glad I told you who he is? <laughs> he said, yeah. And I said, so I'd been telling him, and what do you think happened? He made the final table. Yeah. So I have a feeling he, him not being stubborn, kind of helped a little bit. There you go. Uh, best poker player we've never heard of. Obviously, you play a lot of cash with some unknown faces who crush. Who doesn't get uh, well? Respect you know, they deserve? now you've heard of them, but there was a time when people like David Oppenheim and John Hennigan weren't heard of. Well, some some people might be, but now John won like the 50k, and yeah. David doesn't play tournaments that much. I just uh, saw David today. Actually. There's well, of course, another young player I just mentioned, or I I didn't mention to you, but or maybe I did talking about my bad draw on day three at the World Series this year, Brian Tate. Mm -hmm. Tough player, plays in the big games, hasn't done much in tournaments because he's doing what I did, you know, before I started playing tournaments, which is trying to make a lot of money at cash games. And he's a good player. Best swap or piece you ever got of anybody? I don't ever take a piece of anyone. Really? I don't ever swap. It's all my own money. You see me win and lose. Uh, but I'll tell you a story about it. Okay. I was a. Uh, you know, a cash game player, and Eric Seidel, way back, played tournaments, as you know, famously came in second place. 
And then the poker boom happened, and I now played a WPT v P PT event. And Carl McKelvey, who had played a lot of tournaments, says, you want to swap 5%? And I said, I never take a piece of anyone, and no one ever takes a piece of me. And he says, you think this is your, like your first tournament you ever played? Do you think you're a better tournament player than I am? I mean, I played the main event, but that's about it. I said, no, but I just always play my own mind. I'm not trying to insult you. And he says, you know, he says, you're being a real whatever. He says, you, you know, you're so cocky. I, and I really don't think I'm that – some of these things I've said bragging about myself sound cocky. <laughs> but normally I'm actually not that cocky a yeah. person, you know. And I went to Eric Seidel and I said – you know, who was a friend of mine, I said, Eric, you know, Carl's real mad at me that I wouldn't swap with him. I never swap with anyone. And he says, yeah, a lot of people swap 5% for a sweat, you know, and it kind of, uh, you know, you know, balances out. If you swap enough people, you balance out your risk and all that kind of stuff. And, and lower I, the variance. And, he, and I said, so do you swap with people? He says, yeah. And I said, he said, I think it's cost me about a half million so far. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, obviously, Eric had yeah, done well. Eric was one of the best. So uh, I said, well, in that case, I'm not going to swap with them. So I've never swapped with anyone. Did anybody ever offer you a swap and go on to win huge and make you regret it? I've never even paid attention. There and, you go. And when I have, I have staked people in games and stuff. When people come up to me and ask for me to take a piece of them in a tournament, well, here's another thing that turned me off. I won't, he's a known player, so I won't even give his name. When I give someone money to take a piece, I just assume I'm never getting anything back because I never have. I'm oh, doing man. it for someone who's a friend who, you know, to be nice, okay, because I didn't need money. And one of, the, one of the reasons I got soured, there's another guy who's won several bracelets, and he came up to me one time. He said, Barry, I want to play the 5,000 Hold'em. I don't know if it was no limit, probably no limit. And he said, and I've only got 4,000. I mean, really, could you do me a favor? And I said, no, I don't ever take a piece of it. And he bugged me. He said, we've known each other for so many years. You played cash games with me. Uh, back in Texas, you played cash games, whatever. I, I really want to play this tournament. I'm only a 1,000 short. A thousand's nothing. You, yeah. you play in the big game. And I said, okay. He wore you down. He wore me down. I said, okay. I said, really? He says, yeah, it's just 20% of the buy-in, you know. So I thought, I'm doing this guy a favor. I give him the 1,000. The he says, okay, you've got 12%. <laughs> I said, what? He said, well, you know, there's all, that's the way it works when you, when you yeah. take a piece of something. I said, I looked at him and I He'd said. like, I'm the guy who knows math. <laughs> yeah, and I said, oh, that's the way it works. And then I found out these guys who get staked, that's the way it works for them. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, people who see these tournament players and think they're the greatest players in the world. Yep. No, they often aren't. There they are people who put up. the mark up. And they yeah. got people who put them in, and if you play enough tournament, you know, as you know, anyone who's read my book knows, the number one factor in doing well in tournaments is playing a lot of tournaments. Yeah. So people who play a lot of tournaments will win some tournaments if they're halfway decent players, and so that was the last time I took twenty percent of someone <laughs> in a tournament. I like it. Um, longest session you ever played? When I was in college, we would play the weekend. The whole weekend. Yeah, we would. You know. Friday night, probably start a poker game and see who could last. Man. I would take cat naps some and, you know, but, you know, play a three day session. I remember one thing I couldn't believe though one time was I played this professor who played my game, Gin Rummy. Sometimes the game broke down, he played Gin Rummy. And I was in good shape. I'd been, you know, again, I was a wrestler in, in high school and uh, didn't drink, you know, didn't do drugs. So I was always in good mental and physical shape. And uh, after a day of gin, maybe I think too hard, I couldn't even see my hand. <laughs> and here's this guy, almost 60 years old, playing me under the table. <laughs> so that was one of the times. That was one of the only times I ever had to quit someone because I couldn't even see my hand. You're that tired, huh? Yeah. I did that to Lane Flack, Flack at Chinese Poker. We played for about two days. And, but, of course, Lane wasn't as clean to his body as, as I have been. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he would, like, fall asleep during the hand and take five minutes and then say, what are we playing? <laughs> and we had, we had promised each other it was 100,000 freeze out. And I was up about 60,000. And I didn't want to let him off the hook. And finally he just got to where he was delirious. He said, Bear, I seriously didn't know we were playing Chinese poker. <laughs> And I can't read my cards, 
and you can't hold me to it was like a death match yeah and i he said you can't hold me to this freeze out yeah I'll die at the table. <laughs> he says, yeah, I can't, please. And he says, I have a daughter and all this stuff. <laughs> and then I said, okay. And so I, I won yeah. 60000 We never played again. I we like didn't it. finish the match. Um, uh, okay. I want to know what you're listening to at the table if you ever got headphones on. Well, I can tell you about that. I have my iPad list, and someone said, yeah, you know, people listen to stuff. And I put on the headphones when they first came out with the Bose headphones and all that. And it was a deuce to seven, no limit pot. And the cap was 75. So we were probably playing, I don't know, two and 4,000. Because four and eight, it's at least 100. And someone raised and someone called the cap. And it was to me, and I shoved in. Actually, maybe someone, no, here's what happened. Someone raised, someone raised in, someone called, and I thought it was on me, and I bet the cap, 75000 Yeah. And two guys called, and they both drew, and I was drawing one to, to a seven or something. And yeah. I threw my card away. At this point, Phil Ivey picked up, he has big, kind of big hands, he picked up his hands, he was in the pot too. He hadn't moved any chips and he had said cap. And I didn't realize he was in because I had these headphones on. Yeah. And Phil had a pat jack. Okay. And when I put the money in behind him, he had like a jack nine. He was going to throw the jack away. But now that I drew a card, he said, well, if you're drawing, I'm not drawing. Yeah. And he stayed pat and it was a $300,000 pot. That's right, because yours is binding because you acted out of turn yeah. if he does yeah. nothing. And he won the pot. We all bricked. And he won the pot. And I said, I'm never going to wear headphones again. Yeah. So that was my one time wearing headphones at the table. <laughs> it's an expensive pair of Bose headphones. Yeah. Uh, we finish the podcast the same way every time with a question from the random question generator. And yours is, what is something that really annoys you but doesn't bother most people? Got any pet peeves? There, I, I'm sure I do. Annoying, but usually I go the other direction. As a poker player, there's so many things that annoy people that even if they do annoy me, like Mike Matasaw's voice or talking, <laughs> I always like it actually when Mike's in the game because he's gonna piss some people off, and some of it's, some of it's an act, yeah. some of it's real. But I know if it bothers anything that bothers me, bothers someone else more. That's like a good way to look on the bright side. So I always say I can handle it. <laughs> I had six kids. I can tune out anything, you know. Yeah. And so it's usually the other way around that things bother other people and they really don't bother me. And so I just don't I mean, I don't like people. Well, I well, mean, Well, there the you one, have it, guys. Everyone, if you're at the table with Barry, yeah, the one go out thing, of your way to annoy him. <laughs> he yeah, likes the, it. The one thing probably is abusing dealers. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I end up getting in fights even here. This is a better card club than most at protecting the dealers. Oh, we're at the gardens just, right yeah, now. Yeah, people just go crazy at the dealers. And uh, um, it does aggravate me. And I end up fi fighting with them. That, you know, of course, they're always losing, almost invariably losing when they're doing it. And uh, it's very annoying. And I even had one time where I remember back in the day in San Jose where – this, I cracked this guy's ace is no limit hold him and he said it's the, or was it limit I don't even know if it was limit or, it was limit hold him and he throws the cards toward the dealer and calls her a name and I said what are you doing you can't act like that and I got in a big fight with him and he said she cracked my aces twice <coughs> I said yeah. she didn't do anything she didn't do anything so now I said you realize you look like, like an idiot <laughs> everybody at the table thinks you look like an idiot he says and he, and he said to me I don't think they do I mean, she, you know, she cracked my aces. And finally I said, well, okay, you want to ask them? I bet you everybody agrees with me. And I said to the guy, well, Joe, let's say, in seat one. And he says, well, you know, he's losing. She did. And I said, you're kidding. I asked the next guy. And the guy says, cracked his, she cracked his aces twice. <laughs> and I went around the table, and almost every player at the table agreed with him. Oh, my gosh. 
And I That's couldn't putting believe me on it. tilt right now. And I couldn't believe it that everyone said, well, he had a reason. You cracked his aces. He has a reason has to be mad at the dealer. To do with it. Oh, man. And, and you might think it's crazy. And, and this is actually one area where online poker has helped live poker. Online players never had a dealer, so they didn't have... I mean, they might have thought the site was rigged and Yeah, the that. site's the dealer. <laughs> right. But when they came to live poker, they didn't know you are supposed to blame the dealer yeah. for your beats. That is and true. so a lot Let's of them the... looked at these people blaming the dealer thinking they're idiots. Because to them, the dealer's the random number generator. Yeah. What do you blame on the random number <laughs> generator? So they actually have helped that. Yeah. But back in the day, losing players were abusing the dealers like you wouldn't well, believe, would and hear, they still do. I would hear stories about top players in Bobby's room even being so superstitious about the dealers and like, you know. Oh, of course. I mean, know, even I'm, at the again, top levels, there were people yeah. that were... You know. But but when I think of the people who are the worst ones, mm -hmm. they were live players their whole lives. They weren't the online players. Yeah. I don't think – it's very rare to see online players abusing the dealer. So I give them that. Yeah. They're well-behaved in that way. <laughs> but, Props for you, But guys. live players, even the best uh, – I, I can think of some of the top players who uh, – Maybe don't yell at them, but say, but know who's de I don't even know who's dealing when I lose a hand. Seriously, I don't pay attention. Uh, and the only way a dealer could ever get me to even notice that they dealt me a, an unfortunate hand is by misdealing. Yeah. If I lost a hand on a misdeal where they did something stupid, I would probably <clears throat> excuse me. I would probably notice who's dealing. Yeah. But if the cards were just dealt out, I, I wouldn't even know. Well, that's a good lesson for all you poker players out there and a great way to end this podcast. Barry, I'd like to thank you so much for uh, taking the time. That's the show. Thanks again to Barry G. You can follow him on Twitter, at Barry Greenstein. Uh, if you haven't done so, make sure to, to check out Barry's book, Ace on the River. Uh, Barry's also a member of Team Poker Stars Pro, and since he obviously can't play real money games while he's in the United States, he's actually become one of the top play money players on the site. So check them out there. Uh, if you like what you've heard, then you should subscribe to Poker Stories on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating or a review and let us know about it by sending an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com and we'll hook you up with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Thanks for listening. Attention American poker players. Do you want to legally cash out your poker winnings to PayPal? Then head to GlobalPoker.com and see why it's the fastest growing site for U.S. players. That's GlobalPoker.com.